Hi, and welcome to the Improvisers podcast. I'm Kevin Jaynes, and this is my co-host, Neil Thomas. Thank you, Kevin. In this podcast, we talk with improvisers about their histories, their practices, and their current inspirations, expectations, and aggravations. Who are we talking with today, Kevin? Today, Neil, we've got the opportunity to chat with Paul Roberts. Paul Roberts spoke of his childhood, his early development of a skill in telling whoppers, spoke of an inherent appetite for insecurity. He talks of finding resilience, autonomy, and self-reliance as a practicing artist, and the extraordinary opportunity at Mona Museum in Hobart. He mentions nude modeling, ugly feet, sagging flesh, and rainbows. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Paul Roberts as much as we do. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Neil. Good morning, Kevin. Great to be here. Maybe we can start today's conversation with a question. How did you begin performing, Paul? And what kind of performance? That's a great question. Um, and it's a it's a classic, isn't it? Like, when did it all start? And I and I do appreciate uh, you know the the kind of information that a chronology can offer because we're all uh, involved in in the ephemeral arts. You know, I tried to get involved in visual arts uh, many years ago. My first degree was photography, and I thought that that would be a you know. I, I just, it just appealed to me to have something solid, something you can put on the walls and something you can, you know, fill a warehouse with all the many things that you produce. And, but then I realized after a short time that actually the, the, for me to connect to the, to, to what seems like authenticity and still does actually, then I needed to work with the ephemeral arts, you know, dance and, and storytelling and, um, and when did it all begin? Well, I guess, you know, I was a, I've always had a very tenuous relationship with, with the truth or with the, so as a, as a kid, I was a, I was a storyteller in the sense that I, I would tell whoppers. I think it was my Nana called them whoppers. I would tell big whoppers and I remember I was probably about 10 years old and I was traveling with my two sisters and my mum and dad in the, in the um, I think it was a Ford, one of those long cars from the 70s. And I think actually it was purple. And we had a caravan and this is Perth in the 70s, late 70s. And we traveled with the caravan up north to a place called Calbarry. had some fantastic beaches and, and rocky bluffs and whatnot. And, we, and there was one caravan park and one bakery. And on Saturday, you could get these long, fluffy uh, cream buns. And, and we loved it. And it was amazing. And, and I was, as I was saying, I was very much um, in dreamland most of the time as a kid. And... I used to tell stories and I can remember being in this caravan park in the playground and meeting all these kids for the first time, you know, and, um, and we were allowed to play after it got dark. It was just, you know, it was fantastic. And of course, all, all the, all the doors and windows came off and I just was telling everybody everything. <laughs> and suddenly I was from Sydney and suddenly I knew all about funnel web spiders. And I was telling all these kids and their parents that I was from Sydney and that I, you know, and, and, and we had spiders and it was, uh, you know, it was all pretty, pretty fabulous and, and great. And, and then um, we were there for a week or so, I guess. And anyway, one night I remember walking back from the, the playground 
past all the other caravans towards you know where we were and um and I got to the caravan and there was mum and dad sitting down on the folding table and chairs with the one of these little kids parents having a great chat <sighs> totally busted and I, and when I went to bed that night uh you know like with the sleeping bag like this uh, in the top bunk and my mum, you know, tucking me in and uh, she said to me, and actually this is one of the sentences that chills me even now when I think about it. She said uh, very sweetly, you know, just before she turned the light off in that part of the caravan, I've got a bone to pick with you, Paul. And that was it. <laughs> that was it. So we never actually talked about it. I guess that's why it still haunts me, that sentence. We haven't talked about it yet. She's still alive, my dear old mum. So does that answer the question? I guess it began, you know, back then, this uh, tenuous relationship to, to facts and, and histories and, and yeah, that was kind of, uh, that was kind of the, the, the sort of neurological, mental, emotional, uh, situational uh, milieu that I was creating for myself uh, back then. And um, I was very much a, one of these kids at school that, um, you know, one of the, I don't know about you guys, but um, I suppose it's, it's common for, for the artists to, to, to have been the ones that were a little bit a little bit left to center, a little bit bent when it comes to school and, and you know, that, that, that big pile of children on top of one another. And, and then you notice, oh, everybody else is playing ball sports at lunchtime, but here I am um, in, the, in, the, in the art room uh, in the cupboard. We used to, I had a couple of friends and we used to go to hide in the art room during break. And, and we would sit in the cupboard was fantastic. <laughs> I was I was actually a very happy kid, and I I reflect uh, now and I realise that I got a lot of bullying at, at school. And but the funny thing about it was that 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 I thought it was a good thing. I loved the attention, and um, so yeah, just that typical thing, I guess that I became the clown and you know, people were laughing and, and that was that was a good thing. And I was satisfied and, and yeah, I was a pretty happy kid. I, I love that, Paul. And of course there's resonances for, for us all and um it's interesting that you have made your 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 sort of go to or your sort your your sort of um natural way of surviving within the environment of, of school or um, family, you've managed to manufacture that into a career, a sort of a, a marrying of a of a natural state. Um, sketch sketch a little bit for us that path from sort of natural natural clown to the current superstar that you are now. That sort of arc, fill in the dots. Moments yeah. though. Um, well, so I I was always very good at I, I I kind of you know I think about what I do and I think about it as the I I think of myself as this the my skill is is to pull off being skillless. Um, I don't do anything particularly well but um i guess i guess it's a a pleasure to be in the discomfort of of being on stage and there's a i guess the skillfulness is in uh being able to survive the discomfort of uh, you know having financial insecurity social insecurity um and even art form insecurity you know i i don't actually 
I don't know if I could say that I'm any of the things that I do. I play music now and I sing and I, and I, I've done a lot of sort of cabaret style work in the last few years. Um, and I've started calling it performance art because that is a, is a more comfortable category than anything else that I've used in the past. Um, I'm actually quite satisfied with that. And I've never been satisfied in the past with, you know, I mean, I, 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 I spent some time at VCA, um, in Melbourne doing the, the, the dance school. And I, I really thought, yes, dance, you know, I'm, everything starts for me with the body. Um, I think I'm a dancer and I really, I worked very hard at trying to be a dancer. And I, you know, I, I, I grabbed hold of the, the postmodern uh, lineages and histories and inheritances and, and I really thought that, that that was my field. But there's nothing like time uh, to reveal the, uh, the nature of things. And yeah, I just never got any purchase with that field. You know, the, um, it's funny, I've, I've spent a whole career trying to uh, gather around me the, the support of a, of a network of, of uh, colleagues and co-creators. And um, it's been interesting how the, the various fields like music, dance, um, storytelling, poetry, writers, you know, the different fields, none of them have, uh, none of them have taken up the wonderful offer of, uh, you know, having Paul Roberts in their, in their, um, uh, you know, what it is that they, that they feel comfortable, you know, associating with. Um, but performance art is different because that's kind of anything goes and, um, and, you know, and it has the, the conceptual underpinnings, uh, which I love. And, but as far as uh, creating a career out of, um, yeah, being, being the kind of uh, misfit that I was and am, yeah, that's a really interesting one. And I think that in order to survive, you know, socially and, 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 all the rest, uh, I became a very good listener. And so I was always, uh, I was always the one to be able to slow myself down. You know, my, my speed uh, as a person, you know, everybody's got a tempo and mine was incredibly slow, always has been. And I was able to do that um, you know, in order to survive that, that, and that, that enabled me as well to become a great listener. And, you know, that was my go-to. And, and so as a result, uh, I knew that I, I knew from very early on that I wanted to be an artist and, and almost felt like I was an artist well before I had any proficiency whatsoever. Um, I remember as a kid, I, I got into painting, uh, pots like for plants and I was like yeah this is uh, this is this is it this is what I'm doing I'm I'm a pot painter and <laughs> uh, because I knew that I I knew that I was an artist I just didn't know what I was going to do as an artist and so I became a, a, a good listener and I hung around with artists and uh, before before I knew it, I was I was the one that everybody um, felt good to uh, make fun of. Is 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 kind of a it it it's a bit it's reductive and it gives the wrong kind of uh, like um, uh, anyway. That's not quite it, but but I was the one that you know everybody. Uh, I was good at making people feel good about themselves. Uh, and, and often that was sending myself up. Uh, but it was great. It worked really well. And yeah.
Paul, I'd really like to pick up on the on the notion of um, um, skill and being skillless. Mm. And when I when I think of you, and when I think of your past, and when I think of your very your your many sort of phases, I think of you as having great breadth. And so the skill set might not be sort of singular, but it feels like it feels very wide, mm. and it feels like you're. And it's so good to be sitting here together, looking backwards, I suppose, at, at your past and your sort of periods of formation, um, because it feels like there's there's both breadth, there's history, and there's this sort of wide capacity. I'd really like to talk about that improvisation for you and how it fits in with the ephemeral, with the tenuous, and with this sort of wide base of skill set that I feel you carry. Yeah, that has been a real, uh, an unfolding uh, set of realizations, I suppose. Um, to be honest, improvisation uh, initially, uh, when I, because I started uh, with clown, I'd say that was my first, uh, my first training and uh, improvisation and clown are very aligned. Um, you know the surprise and 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 getting into trouble. You know they're they're kind of key for clowning. And I, because of uh, the way that my mind works, I I was always entering the stage not knowing what the hell I was going to do. Just you know, I think I think that was much to the the dismay of all the my colleagues because we'd work it all out. And then I'd enter and I'd be like, I have no idea what we agreed, but I'm going to, I'm going to listen as carefully as I can. And, and I will remember once somebody does something and that was great. Um, and that, and that very much created a, a kind of um, sensibility and, a, and an image that was, a, became associated with me that, that was, you know, very helpful for clowning. Um, the sort of well-intentioned idiot that uh, after a while, once uh, once we began working with a scene or, or in rehearsal or whatever, and things would clarify, I would then be able to dance or, uh, you know, tell a story or, or sing a song or whatever. And I think... Um, even now, improvisation is 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 sort of a tool uh, that I use uh, for positioning myself, so that I can then deliver something. Whether that's dance, I mean now, whether that's dance or whether that's uh, connecting somehow to a theme or a concept that I've decided from the outset. Is, is what it is that I want to be uh, working with. Um, but improvisation is, uh, in in the way that I've approached it and used it, it's, it's been just an agreement with myself that anything goes until I've arrived kind of thing. And I think giving myself license uh, for it to be like that, that has that's kind of been the way that I've survived and the way that I've created a career. It's kind of the ultimate tool uh, just to give oneself license to uh, do whatever's necessary, by whatever means is necessary in order to position yourself where you need to be. Yeah. Tell, tell, I'm intrigued by that phrase, position yourself where you need to be. Mm. What, what, what is that position? Is is that a state of mind? Is that a uh, an arriving at the 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 score well, that, that you're talk, Yeah, it's this wonderful sense of authenticity. You know when. Um, when 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 all of the the showbiz of your experience is, sort of falls away and 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 you land with your edge and you're like yeah this is uh 
this is this is the best that I can do in terms of I'm I'm very much in my human experience. Um, you know, there's no bullshit. Uh, and and I'm really with you. I'm really with you. I, I've got my senses. Everything's telling me that that you know. It's, I mean, it's a it's kind of a an arrival in a comfortable moment, I guess, with with other people and and with a space. Mm. It's an arrival. Paul, I saw you perform in Melbourne last year, and I hadn't seen you perform for quite a few years before that. Oh, yeah. And and I to watch you perform, I guess from this place of which you're speaking, and in a sort of a increasingly no holds barred way, um, mm -hmm. but it's so readily uh, able to. It's we can. It's so easily recognized the sort of wealth of background that you now carry and the explorations that you've um, persisted with that to see you see you now well that's a year ago and I'm I'm sure that you're exploring what you're exploring now but it w was wonderful to see this sort of um, um, availability you speak of and authenticity and in some ways transparency it seems so often you're showing yourself and you you said there's no no bullshit there and it feels like there's no bullshit there as though as though you're showing yourself and what is there uh, we're seeing is what is happening and i i love that sense of no gap that's a great that's a great review um i'm um <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm 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 happy that you had that experience and and that's really that's my goal yeah that's that's what i want to deliver um I think, you know, for a long time there, I talking about, you know, how the, the question before was how did I manage to sort of steer this uh, appetite for insecurity into a career? And um, there, you know, it was, a very, you know, I was very dogged. I really did want a career. And, um, but, you know, I tell you what, the, the, the amount of resistance that the that the world uh, puts up against uh, artists having a career, being able to support themselves from these explorations and 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 these successes, you know, when they come along, it really doesn't matter how successful I've been. You know, the review you just gave, uh, Kevin, was beautiful, and um, I've had. I've had a lot of very powerfully positive reviews like that from people and also from from crowds you know when when I've done something um like I I worked at Mona for for a while and um you know there were I was doing 4 days a week for a while and 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 um often in the restaurant uh there and there'd be like you know 150 people say and you do lunchtime and um i do a a few numbers and 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 the, the the response was so powerful people really really loved it and then and then you know speaking of the ephemeral arts it uh you know you go home you come back the next day and and um uh one of the the directors from way way above has decided that uh that that it's not on anymore and you know, so you're suddenly um, faced with uh, a, a complete gap, like the, the all the momentum of the work suddenly falls into a, a black hole and it's like starting from scratch. And so, you know, given those kind of conditions, trying to create a career, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's been a, a riddle. Um, and I've learned a lot about resilience, I suppose. And I've le learned a lot about autonomy and um, uh, self-reliance. And I was reflecting the other day, I've been doing life modeling on and off for the last few years, which I love. And I was reflecting the other day that, you know, standing there in silence, you know, while these people draw me, and 
again, it's you know you can you can tell when the room is is uh, it's not boring, and you know it's not boring. What you're doing, even though every nobody's laughing or talking or anything, there's just the sense, sound of pencils scratching on paper, and and I was in that in that experience, and I was reflecting later, and I thought that you know it's like a like in order for me to do that work, I've I've had to come to a point of uh, accepting my my sort of my my drooping ever more drooping body. Um, particularly the parts like my feet, you know, these ugly parts that I don't think uh, anybody's going to say that they like looking at my feet, but, you know, especially now. But um, I have come to, a, to a, a time in my life and a relationship with my body where, I, where I, I've accepted and even embraced uh, even the ugly parts and that's a great consolation for for not having a career or <laughs> for not being a successful artist i suppose some days i feel successful some but often i don't uh i i'm interested in the experience of of performing in the in the very moment of performing, how that how that uh, I'm interested in consciousness, states of consciousness, and performance. And we've sort of touched on it a little bit. I'd be interested to know your your take. You know, for instance, there was sort of a hint that perhaps there's a zone that you could kind of move into and and arrive the point of arrival. Yeah, I wonder if you've got. Yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts on on that. Yeah, for sure. That's a that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, and you know what? I think for me, it's about I've always I've always fancied what I do as 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 being a very inclusive approach because I've always uh, I've had such an incredibly abstract experience of of world and 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 and, and being being a being in, 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 you know, having a lifetime. And actually just this morning I was driving down the road and there was a, a beautiful cloudscape in the distance. And there was one of those rainbows that goes from cloud to cloud. And I, I don't know why, but I, I saw that and I was like, yeah, that's, that's my colleague up there. That, uh, phenomenon that you know um, and so to to you know it's been my lifetime project to bridge that kind of experience into connecting with other people you know so to do a dance that's completely abstracted and um, you know just shapes and, and velocities and that has never been enough because I've wanted to. I've wanted to dance uh, whilst playing Kanye or Beyonce or something like that to to merge or marry the two so that people can go, oh yeah, this is relatable somehow. That that guy doing these very strange things, you know. Uh, locomoting, as our wonder would say, from there to there, looking like that is completely bizarre. And why would anybody want to do that? But oh, there's a love song playing whilst he's doing that, and oh, that does something for me. Uh, you know, oh yeah, I, I I feel out of my depth in my romance or in my marriage or whatever, and it's confusing and it's kind of jagged and irregular and oh, I don't feel so alone, suddenly I can relate to this guy. So that's the what I mean by inclusive. I, I've always wanted to make art that is bridging my experience of of being, which is so kind of, you know, it's 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 very weird, but um but it's authentic, you know, it's like that's how I 
that's how I am. And I've always wanted to, to I, my, my project in life has been to find out how can I bridge into, you know, communication with other people. Uh, the strangeness that I experience. And um, what was the question? It, 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 it doesn't matter. The answer was so, so much more interesting than the question. Um, I, I, I'd be interested in hearing a couple of stories from Mona. Yeah. What were you, what were you up to there? Describe a couple of those uh, nights, afternoons. Mona was, um, Mona was 12, uh, just a bit over 12 months of me being hired as a performance artist. Um, initially, it was during COVID when the museum and the restaurant opened up and they wanted like a, a kind of performance artist greeting for people. Because it was Mona, they wanted, they wanted all the COVID uh, regulations to get delivered in a way that, that was like, you know, off the wall. So I would wear a lab coat and I'd greet people as they were walking up the path from the car park. And I would, uh, I'd be sometimes lying in the bushes and I'd call out to them and they'd be like, oh. And then um, I'd say, oh, uh, you want to go inside the museum, do you? And they'd be like, uh, uh, and I'd say, okay, well, you got to, you know, you got to stay seated. You got to, you know, there's no dancing, you know, and I'd lay out all the rules and, and, it went so well that the the powers that be were like, well, this is great. Let's uh, let's grow it. Let's you know. And so it went from that into performance art in the restaurant whilst people were having a meal. And they said they said it it was it, you know Mona's a very interesting place. It's like often art institutions that have a lot of money to throw around are, are, are run by bureaucrats and bureaucrats have a skill set that is particular and but Mona is run from the top by artists and so that creates quite a um, an interesting um set of parameters you know going in there as a performance artist i was told once after i'd been there for a while that i could go into the museum and i could do anything i wanted as long as it was good <laughs> so i was like okay game on <laughs> and one time I was really suffering at the time because my marriage uh, had just uh, gone down in a ball of flames and I was about two years into that um, and I realized, I got up one morning and I realized, you know what, there's no matter how many sleepless nights I have trying to process all the things that are going on, this is, uh, this is sadness that I'm going to carry with me for the rest of my life. And... So I got dressed and, you know, got in the car and I was driving to Mona and, and I thought to myself, you know, you're not alone with this actually. Like that's, that's life for everyone. You get to a certain point in your life and, and you, you know, you, you've gone through whatever. And I think for some people it starts very early in life, but, for me, it was the ending of my marriage. There was a sadness that I would never be solved. And it, and it was now, you know, a part of who I am. So I, 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 I got closer to Mona and I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to dress all in black and I'm going to stand somewhere in the museum in the shadows where it's dark and and I'm going to be ocean of tears. And so from that uh, initial, see the other thing about 
the Mona period was that I could experiment and I could explore and I was free to evaluate my experiments. And, and I had this uh, river of people passing by, you know, so I was doing very short engagements and I was getting feedback constantly. You know, often I was working with an audience of like five people and then they'd move on. And I could then reflect and adapt and change and make it totally different for the next five people. And, you know, do that like 30 times a day kind of thing. And so Ocean of Tears, uh, it evolved to the point where I would wear black socks, black tights, uh, black skivvy and a, uh, a black stocking over my face and black gloves. And I'd stand in the shadows and people wouldn't necessarily see me until they were right on top of me and then they would scream. And because it was Mona, see Mona as well is an ultimate frame. You know, people are ready for anything. So they'd scream, everyone would turn around and they'd, and I'd say, there's an invitation. And they'd say, okay. And I'd say, the invitation is that you reflect on your life and you wait until it comes to mind a story from your life that has to do with sadness, a sadness that can't be resolved. Maybe you've lost somebody that you love. It's something that can't be resolved. And once you have that story, you call my name and I'll dance for you. And they'd go, right. And I'd say, my name is Ocean of Tears. And so then I'd go, and, and by this stage, you know, like a lot of people would have stopped and like, what's going on? And then this guy, all in, this skinny guy, all in black, I'd go and stand in a lit part of the space and I'd wait and I'd just stand there. And the atmosphere was powerful. And sometimes it, you know, like young people who had nothing, they'd just say, they'd call my name and I'd dance. But sometimes uh, people would really have a moment and then they'd call out ocean of tears and then I'd start dancing. And it was really uh, very, uh, yeah, it was very powerful. I'd go home from work after doing that, you know, for a few hours and I was like, you know, if I if I die now on driving home, then it's all good because I've done something pretty great. Oh, Paul, that's oh, that's so moving to mm. to to hear that. Um, not just the content, and and I can certainly relate to that content, but but the relational meeting with others and the sort of availability, the responsiveness, the the sort of meaningfulness in a way of what you do. And and the meaningless meaningfulness for those who are meeting you in that place, and and I want to use that word meaningfulness in in the biggest possible sense of what that might imply, but it feels like it's 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 purposed. Your life, your performance is entwined, and that you are a resource for what you do and for others. Um, ain't a question, is it? But it's um it's sort of a confirmation and it is a bit of an open question of um, comment on that, Paul, and, and give us a little bit more. Well, you know, I guess what I think about is I've got to a point in my life where I've, I've got something to say, and I don't necessarily always know what that is, but it seems like it's important that I, that I keep putting myself out there. And I think the power of improvisation is that you, you, you allow contexts larger than yourself to come to bear on what you do. You know, we, we walk on stage not knowing in detail what we're going to do and something about the crucible being inside that crucible with an audience 
or you know the intensity of being looked at and um and wanting to connect you know both to myself and to others so that's you know ideally that's a, that's a pretty uh that's a big moment and being in that moment and not knowing um i guess that's my skill uh and then letting the moment form me as uh, uh it's it's become yeah it's become more and more interesting the older that i get um which is ironic because it's it's more and more difficult to to get funding to to convince audiences to come and um but that's that's okay um but yeah i recently as i was saying i've been uh playing around with cabaret and that's that's a great format again it's the episodic uh structure so i can i can sing a song and you know maybe some people like that uh but it doesn't matter because the next episode i'm dancing or i'm uh, playing some music and the next episode I'm telling a story and there's a kind of an accumulation of effects um, which works well for me um, yeah I they I it also allows me to to bring to bear all these different interests that I have like music and poetry and storytelling and dance so it's a great format um, but you know, I, I I came across a poem by Mary Oliver, and I loved it so much, and and I I put it into one of these cabarets that we did, and it was such a fantastic uh, sort of frame with which to dance. See the the ocean of tears thing, the 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 way that the improvised dance made sense to me was the the framing, and again this poem creates another framing that that uh, that I find satisfying and and actually you know yeah delivers what it is that I want to deliver um do you want to hear it okay so so I, the scene that I did was I would enter uh wearing a red dress a beautiful red dress and I would start to take it off and and everybody's like oh yeah this is a bit trashy this he's you know he's gonna take it he's, he's wearing a dress uh you know a pathetic bid at, at relevance at uh you know engaging with the you know the current uh the currents of now and i and you know and i wear that moment and and I say, uh, and I begin the poem, may I never not be frisky. May I never not be frisky. May I never not be risque. And may my ashes, friend, when you have them and give them to the sea, may they leap among the waves, still wanting above all else to dance for the world take the dress off and then do a dance in my undies. <laughs> uh, that was great. That was a good one. Ah, uh, Paul, 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 Paul. Thank you. Um, we're, we're heading towards time now. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking in my own small way, I'll, I'll bring it a, a Cummings poem, which is something like for every beautiful answer, there's an even more beautiful question. Neil, do you have a more beautiful question to finish off the podcast? Oh, uh, I, I, um, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think I do. I, I, I sort of, uh, again, uh, overwhelm Paul. It's just so, so wonderful to, to hear parts of your world and and um thank you so much for your generosity your openness your humility and your 
strong sense of um, investigating who you are and hence who we are. So um, really, thank you so much. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you.